The Databases for Machine Learning and Machine Learning for Databases seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Google and from contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome to another session for our uh, seminar series this semester. Uh, we're excited today to have distinguished Carnegie Mellon Database Group alumni, uh, Dana Van Aken, Dr. Dana Van Aken. Uh, she finished her PhD at CMU in 2021. Uh, and since then, she's gone off to uh, be a co-founder with me and the CTO of Autotune. And so, which in my opinion is the premier ML or AI for database uh, tuning service. And so she's here to talk about you know, some of the things we've learned and some of the things she's, she's been doing at Autotune. So as always, if you have questions for Dana, please unmute yourself and say who you are and fire your que question off at any time. And then uh, if you can't unmute yourself, post in chat and I will interrupt Dana and, uh, and ask your question. So Dana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for coming back. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Andy, for having me. Um, again, my name's Dana. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Autotune along with Andy. Um, so today I'm just here to talk about Autotune and Andy gave a great intro. I have been working on Autotune for a long time now. Um, I've been working on it since 2015. So it's about eight years. Um, and I guess about three of those years has been uh, between two and three is, uh, you know, Autotune, the commercial product. So with that, I've lost my mouse. Hold on, that's okay. Okay, here we are. So with that, let's get started with the talk. Um, I'm going to start by discussing some, you know, background information. I'll uh, kind of explain what you know a tuning service is, um, and introduce Autotune at a high level. Then I'm going to spend some time um, reviewing what Autotune, the academic version, was, and sort of like what what the algorithms were, and you know what what that looked like back then. Um, then we'll kind of, you know under keep it real. We'll go over some of the uh, some of the assumptions and you know incentives that that didn't quite pan out you know from from the academic version to the commercial version and some of the stuff that we had to go back and really think about how to you know fix once we're launching Autotune as a real product um, and after that we will conclude. All right, so we'll uh, get started with some basic background about uh, database tuning. So, you know, <laughs> I, I feel like I've said this sentence so many times um, because I, you know, databases are just notoriously, notoriously hard to tune. Um, finding the, you know, right knob configuration or, you know, the the most efficient queries or like the right partitioning scheme, it really depends on the workload and the hardware and the data and, and other factors. Um, so it's, it's you know, traditionally a very manual problem that has been solved where um, people, you know, will hire human experts, often in the form of DBAs, um, to, you know, come help tune their databases. They might employ them full time. But, you know, ultimately, like, with, you know, the increasing complexity of today's systems, you know, there's Postgres and MySQL are always adding more knobs. Um, finding these human experts is, you know, they're they're harder to find these days, and uh, they're also quite expensive to employ. So, the, you know, at a high level, what what Auto Team brings to the table is just an, an automated service that uses machine learning uh, to be able to, you know, automatically configure your database and optimize it. All right, so um, again, Autotune is an automated database tuning and resource optimization service. Um, as we already covered, it uh, is based on research that um, out, out of Carnegie Mellon University that I worked on with Andy during my PhD. Um, and you know, the at the crux of it, it just uses machine learning to help optimize um, in the configurations of a DBMS. So one thing to note is that the um, the academic uh, project was only focused on configuration knobs. Um, in the commercial product, we've expanded, you know, the offering and the types of tuning that, that we can provide to include knobs, indexes, queries, 
cloud configuration. Uh, we also provide some, you know, table level recommendations around when statistics are stale. Um, so we we provide like a whole lot more than we used to. And as far as you know, what we support right now, uh, we currently support Amazon, RDS, and Aurora, and specifically MySQL and Postgres. Um, as to why, uh, you know, providing like not supporting on-prem databases was more of a, a strategic decision and that um, Amazon provides a lot of like, you know, normalization, standardization around how you can apply knobs, you know, how you can collect data. So that actually simplifies it quite a bit. So we're not, you know, writing uh, one-off like clients, you know, to, to go collect data from, you know, this place and that. Um, Dana, somebody's asking whether you support Aurora Serverless. We do. Yes, we do. We we also support Aurora Serverless. We do. Any follow-ups? Okay. Yeah, for uh, both MySQL and Postgres. Good question. So next I'm going to go ahead and hop into um, going over the, you know, reviewing the academic version of Autotune. So, yeah. Hello. Okay. I wasn't expecting all of that. I thought it was a little bit more staggered, but that's fine. Um, so do you see the little hat? There's like a, a little academic hat next to Autotune. I just have that hat there to indicate that we're talking about the academic version of Autotune. So hopefully that will help distinguish, you know, which version we're talking about. Um, so, you know, it, basically to go over an overview of how Autotune works. In the very first step, um, the user will select the target objective that they wish to optimize for. Um, in commercial Autotune, we highly recommend the query latency, and uh, that's what a lot of our customers choose. But this could be the throughput, it could be the CPU utilization. Um, it's really up to you know the user. And uh, with that, we uh, provide a you know a, an agent that users can deploy in their own environment. And what that does is it will connect to the database and collect you know, various forms of telemetry, including the figure configuration knobs, the database runtime metrics. Um, commercial Autotune also you know, collects query information. So that is uh, the purpose of the, um, sort of the client side agent. So you know, the um, Autotune will uh, periodically collect this information uh, from the database system and uh, send it back to the tuning manager, which stores it in the data repository. Um, and so there's something that, that we refer to in the paper as, as an observation period. And it's just a period of time where you're you know, collecting these metrics. Um, I, I believe we collect metric information once a minute or maybe once every five minutes. But um, the observation period is the period of time where you want to observe a given configuration uh, to um, before you know crunching on the data and deciding uh, which configuration to um, to suggest next. So uh, again, the um, we're going to include the uh, most recent observation in that tuning data. We're going to crunch on the data and then we're going to spit out um, the next configuration. Uh, the um, other team believes will improve, you know, your system performance over the baseline configuration and configurations it's suggested so far. And so as far as like what the difference is between um, uh, Autotune, the academic project and, and commercial Autotune. So again, um, we support AWS. So in the first step, uh, the user must grant us um, a number of IAM role permissions. This is to, you know, collect CloudWatch data, RDS data, performance insights data, and optionally, they can provide us with write permissions so that we can actually apply configurations directly to the, you know, their database, you know, on behalf of the user. Um, in addition, you know, this is additional data that we collect down in step three. And then finally, um, when, you know, we go generate new configurations, a commercial version of Autotune will also generate, um, uh, health checks, you know, index recommendations, query recommendations, and et cetera. Dana, quick question. Yes. Do you ever end up with a situation where the telemetry data can become 
much bigger than the actual database? <laughs> um, well, I don't think we're quite there yet. Although I was just talking with our engineering team about um, how how our, our storage is starting to explode. I guess we collect about eight gigabytes of telemetry a day. So we're we're starting to have to think about that. But um we're I am I answering your question correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and the reason I ask is you know, the Microsoft guys always complain if they start collecting all telemetry, it'll be more than the customer data in less than a year. So I was wondering if you're starting to see some versions of that problem, especially if on the smaller databases, which sometimes are very valuable, then many enterprise valuable databases are not that big. They might be sub 100 gigs and you could easily get there. That, Great, yeah. that was good. We're, we're just starting to get there um, and we are probably going to have to put a customer policy in place soon, You know, alerting them of how, how much history we can provide them because right now we provide the whole history. Um, so yes, that, that is starting to become a problem. Uh, so what I'm going to go over now is just kind of the motivation for Autotune way back in the day in 2015 you know, when, when Andy and I started working on this problem. So what Autotune is, is it's, it's an external tuning service, meaning, you know, it's not like built into the code base of MySQL or Postgres. Um, it can, you know, hook onto any database and the, the goal was to make it, you know, pretty extensible, right? So Maybe you have to provide it with you know the knob names and some basic metadata about the knobs, but you don't have to provide it with any domain knowledge. Um, so you can pretty you can pretty much you know take the same algorithm and use it on Postgres, use it on MySQL, use it on I don't know Cockroach uh, and so on. Um, and you know the to to make that happen, like a lot of the techniques that we came up with were you know automatic. They're you know everything in, in that algorithm in the machine learning pipeline was pretty much automated. Um, and so the, you know, the main idea behind Autotune is, you know, tuning takes a lot of time and uh, uses a lot of resources. So uh, the idea was to leverage the training data that we've already collected from previous tuning sessions um, to help to new DMS deployments that come along more efficiently. Um, and so the way that we do this is um, we're going to train uh, models from the data in our uh, all of the you know previous and historical data in our data repository, and we're going to use that data to help us figure out you know which are the most important knobs, um, and and also to try and find which of the workloads that we've seen previously is most similar to our current workload. And then the idea is that we can reuse the data from the most similar workload, you know, to help bootstrap and, and jumpstart the, the tuning process while there's uh, no data for the new deployment. All right, so a little you know, outline of the algorithm. Um, so at a high level, this is the Autotune machine learning pipeline. Um, two of the parts, the workload characterization and knob identification, uh, those are those run as background processes. And then the automated tuning component is um, the algorithm that's going to be interacting um, and generating configurations after each observation period. So the the workload characterization period, or excuse me, the workload characterization um, is a data reduction method. So basically what we're doing is we're feeding it all of the um, as you know, uh, somebody pointed out there's there's a ton of metrics. We're going to feed in all of that metric data and try and prune uh, and find a subset of metrics um, that capture the distinguishing characteristics of um, different workloads. So for this, um, we've used uh, factor analysis and clustering, uh, but there's you know this was this was back in 2017. There's been a lot of great papers uh, published that that used you know other techniques. So at a high level, it's just a data reduction technique. Um, similarly, uh, for knob identification, we're going to analyze all of the data in our repository um, and try it in, uh, we use the lasso algorithm, which is a feature selection algorithm to try and determine, you know, the order, imp order of importance of the configuration knobs. And, you know, this is very helpful 
for trying to, you know, decide which are the most important knobs to tune. Um, as you know, as I'll, as I'll go over next, the automated tuning component uh, uses a form of Bayesian optimization. And the algorithm is much more efficient with fewer configuration knobs. So that's that's the real motivation there. All right, so for the, the automated uh, tuner component, um, it, it uh, has two parts. So the first part, it does the workload mapping. So using um, the, the data output, uh, you know, the um, set of metrics output by the workload characterization component, um, it's going to, you know, compare those metrics across the different previous workloads that, that we've tuned in the past with the current target workload, which is the workload that we're trying to tune. And it's going to compare those metrics and basically figure out which is the most similar uh, workload to the current one that we're tuning. That's when we start part two. So once we figured out that out, um, we train a Gaussian process model off of the data we've collected so far from the uh, target workload, along with the data from the previous workload that we deemed you know, most similar to the target. So we're gonna train a model on that and um, uh, in order to generate the next config. And so the, um, the way that the algorithm chooses the next configuration to recommend is it trades off exploration and exploitation throughout the entire tuning session. So sometimes it will choose exploration, which means it's going to try uh, data points that it knows very little about. And then other times it will try exploitation, which is um, where it's going to try uh, typically data points that performed really well in the past that it does know about. All right. Um, Next, we'll go over some of the uh, assumptions that we made in the paper. Oh, there's the there's the red. Right I was hoping it would highlight. Um, so, you know, our our machine learning research, along with many other papers, um, make certain assumptions that that don't quite pan out um, in the real world. So, one of these is just that the optimization pro process is just a one time offline activity. Um, we we also kind of assume that that the DBA has you know the tools needed to deploy um, a copy of the database on you know similar hardware and sort of you know recreate that that workload um, uh, you know separate from the production machine. Uh, the workloads you know inevitably because it's really hard to get access to any sort of real data. Um, we use benchmarks, and because of that, we only really see like the efficacy of these algorithms on, you know, benchmark data, which is static, um, you know, it's fixed. Basically, we can get away with doing an observation period in five minutes. We can just look at five minutes worth of data to determine, you know, whether, like, what the next configuration should be, because it's just, like, very, it, it's just static. Um, and finally, uh, we, we sort of take for granted how difficult it is that like and we assume that there's a knowledge base of high quality data available or the ones like you know readily easy for us to access and so this is you know these are just a few of the items um where there's a little bit of a, a, a disconnect between research and industry um and it certainly doesn't mean that the you know research is not impressive by any means it certainly is impressive but you know Andy and I kind of well, especially Andy, but like myself, I still have, you know, one foot, a little little foot in the door in academia. Um, I, I would love to see, you know, more uh, problems being solved in research that are a little bit more relevant to the problem I'm working on now. Um, yeah, I think that brings us to the next section. So yes, in this section, I'm going to just give a few examples of, you know, like I just named the assumptions. Let's dig a little bit deeper there. All right, so um, challenge number one, it is not practical to tune every database offline in a repeatable environment. Well, there's, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for this, but at a high level, um, the, the sort of two setups that, that we looked at, you know, while, while I was a PhD student were either um, uh, 
trying to tune the staging database and then up, take those, uh, you know, take the, config, the optimal configuration for the staging database and apply it to the production database. Um, or uh, uh, do like sort of a workload replay where you're copying the workload. Um, we learned very quickly with one of our initial customers that staging databases, honestly, like for most of our customers and, and ourselves, staging and dev databases don't look anything like production database. So what happened is we we tuned the customer staging database and they got a 15%, you know, reduction in IOPS, uh, which is cost savings, you know, because they're on Aurora. Um, but then once we applied the same configuration to their production database, we only saw, you know, a 1% improvement. And, you know, in retrospect now, I'm I'm happy that we didn't <laughs> didn't make things worse, but you know, didn't help. Um so yeah, the the other one I, I kind of touched on, um, users can't capture workloads and replay them not easily. Oracle has um, this database replay tool that's that's just amazing, honestly. But sophisticated tools uh, for replaying workloads and you know capturing the traces and making sure that you know, I guess getting it's a repeatable environment and you're getting stable results. Uh, those those tools don't exist to the best of my knowledge for MySQL and Postgres to the degree that, for example, Oracle has them. So this is, you know, th this is another thing that, that didn't pan out. So I, what ended up happening then, right? Well, interestingly, um, what happened is a bunch of our customers tuned their production databases directly. Uh, we've, you know, kind of earned that trust and we have various safeguards in place to make sure that, um, you know, we don't harm or, you know, cause any degradation to their database. I'll go into that later. But um, this graph right here is just showing that um, actually 55% of our customers, I collected this data on Friday. These are active customers who, you know, have applied configurations within, I don't know, the, like the past week or so. And 55 of them, 55% are actually tuning their prod database directly. Um, unknown here, like actually the way that I determine this is I look at the name of the database or the tags, you know, the AWS tags in the environment, a lot of them will just say prod. So unknown just means like there weren't any hints about what kind of database it was. All right. Can you say, uh, can you, can you say how you got the hints? Like yeah. how, how do you know what, how do you know what the type is? Oh, sure. Um, I just, I, hold on, sorry. Okay, let me go back here. There I am. Um, basically, like, so the database identifiers is the name that the Amazon lets you assign to a database. And a lot of people will just name it like my prod DB or like, I, I don't know, EU dash D, EU dash something dash prod, EU dash app, app one dash prod. Um, so that's, that's one way, like if they have prod in the name of the database, or if it's an Aurora cluster, it's the name of the Aurora cluster, then that's one of the hints. Um, the other is that Amazon lets you assign tags to various resources, which can be helpful with like billing or just trying to figure out, you know, classify what which of your resources you're using are for production versus staging versus dev. So a lot of people will use exactly those tags like prod staging dev um, to distinguish their resources. So that's the other hint. Thanks. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. So collecting large amount of high quality training data is hard. Yes, it's very hard. Um, so, you know, Oh, I should have switched these points, but that's okay. Um, so one one problem is that like <laughs> workloads are not static at all. Like honestly, I I just popped in, looked for a customer, you know, looked for a few minutes for a customer, and immediately like here's this you know Im this image of the CPU utilization I came up with. Like this is over the course of a month, as you can see. Um, you know, it looks like there's there's you know a period where the the workload demand increase over the course of the month, and then kind of it, it, what's to say is like it, it's not a rep it's not a repeatable baseline. It's it's not a repetitive pattern necessarily. Um, so this is you know one way in which like the data is just itself not as high quality. Um, and so how do we you know how do we solve this as a company? Well. 
luckily, this is this is a pretty noisy example. Um, a lot of our customers, you know, we support MySQL and Postgres, so it's no surprise they have transactional workloads and they tend to be uh, quite cyclic and, you know, exhibit like, you know, day, night, diurnal patterns. So therefore, like, whereas we were using the observation period of five minutes in the um, research paper, um, we now use an observation period of 24 hours because that usually kind of captures a full cycle um, of, you know, the workload. But what this means is, you know, whereas we were could capture 288 data points a day with the research, we're now capturing one, one a day. So, you know, collecting this data, even though we're a company now, we have real workloads, there, it's, you know, we still don't have the data that we need, actually next bullet, we still don't have the data that we need to build generalizable models. You know, for that, we need training data for diverse set of training data for workloads, hardwares, configurations, um, and probably more. So the, you know, what that means is that basically like a lot of, a lot of our work um, on like the workload characterization, building those generalizable models and, you know, trying to reuse training data, we, we just don't have the data available to be able to do that. So we have to, you know, try different strategies and I'll be going into those um, a little bit later in this presentation. Um, yeah, and so we just don't, yeah, last points, we don't have the training data to, to um, use such techniques effectively. So the other major difference is, of course, is we have real customers. Um, and the number one rule of customers is you do not crash their their databases. Um, we we've I, I would say we spent a lot of time and put a lot of thought and effort into trying to build trust with our customers. Interestingly, like when Andy and I, you know, um, and Bohan incorporated the startup, there weren't really any products like ours on the market. You know, like I, I think the distinguishing factor is we can actually take, you know, a configuration and, and apply it on behalf of the user. So we really do automate the full loop. Um, and there weren't, I, I don't believe like any uh, companies that we could, you know, really look to for, for how they handled that. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, overall we have to be very careful with, you know, what we're applying to, to the database. Um, we, we spend a lot of time thinking, you know, it's not just, I, I would never like just throw the algorithm or just pass along to the, sorry, the knob characterization or sorry, the, the feature importance algorithm for knobs. I would never just, you know, take the output of that and hand it to a customer. Um, you know, we, we really do have to have to look at, at, you know, what we're, what we're recommending and, and make sure that it's safe. Um, uh, customers um, care a lot more about stability than peak performance. Peak performance is inevitably what we, you know, measure in, when we in research papers. Um, it makes sense, but at the end of the day, like if if you're getting a if if the customer workload um, is stable and like you know performance is up a bit, like customers are happy. Um, the other major thing that was hard for us was uh, time to value. Um, so. How, how do we show the customer, the, you know, how do we show customers the benefit of using Autotune in days? I mean, ideally it would be minutes, but, you know, like I said, once we change the uh, tuning interval to 24 hours, you know, it could be weeks before, um, before they, they act, before the algorithm converges on the, you know, a near optimal configuration. Um, so we've we've had to think a lot. Like this was, you know, a lot of the incentive behind offering health checks, um, among like index and query recommendations. Um, it's just a, you know, we we need to provide value um, immediately. And then the other thing that goes along with this is we also need to set customer expectations on, you know, the length of time these things will take. Um, a lot of customers just don't really. They want something where they just click a button and everything works. But some of them will, you know, want to add every single knob, like in, in the whole entire, you know, selection of knobs that we like add, the, the one add, and they, I've, I've seen like two customers in, in our time add the full selection. And of course, like if you do that, I mean, the time that it would take to, to converge or tune is just astronomical. So, you know, we, we've been trying to think about like the best way to educate customers about, um, uh, 
sort of like the behind the scenes, the machine learning without, you know, div divulging too much, I guess. Um, so that brings on to uh, keeping it straight. So, um, you know, to to overcome some of these challenges, um, we've put, you know- Actually, very... so, so Dana, yeah. there's some questions, questions in chat, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. That's I... my fault. Uh, so, so, uh, Ashkay, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, so I, I was just uh, wondering, so what happens if uh, autotune itself crashes? So do you like persist the information somewhere or it's like the customer or it's like the database's responsibility to, uh, persist the, like the configurations that auto autotune recommends? So I think, okay, so the question is like, what happens if Autotune crashes? Yes, um, yes. Luckily, we haven't had to deal with that. But let's, what, what does happen sometimes is like the um, the client side uh, agent will crash. And so mm -hmm. I, I think that the question is like, who, is, is the question like, how do we recover those configurations or how do we guarantee that they're applied or? Uh, how, how do we recover the configuration? Oh, okay. Well, so the um, the configurations are, are uh, stored in our back, you know, stored in our backend database. Mm -hmm. But is I would say like we can easily recover a a similar configuration by just rerunning the algorithm on the same data. Um, sure. Of course, if we lose all the data, um, then then we would be in trouble. Okay. Good. Thank you. And Amazon does versioning for the, the configurations as well. So Amazon's storing this stuff and that's persistent for us as well. Okay, thanks. And then Wayne asks, have you looked at evaluating the contribution contribution usefulness of a particular data point? Wayne, do you want to extrapolate on that? Well, you're, you're very low, your volume. All right, I can't hear him. Um, yeah, so he's asking, so he's asking, like, have we looked at, say, like, for a particular data point, I guess, across multiple data points in a time series, is one more valuable th than another? No, I don't. I don't it says, think... from a few slides ago, looking at five minutes of data versus one day of data. Wait, what, what, like, why do you choose one day versus five day, five minutes? Oh, oh, sure. Um. So the reason that we choose one day, I, I, I probably just sped right through this, um, is because most of our customers have um, have periodic workload patterns where you know they there's there's really like no uh, activity at night, and then it starts picking up in the morning, gets busy, you know, high demand in the afternoon, and then goes down in the evening. So we can kind of um, sort of generalize and try and pick good default values. Uh, based on the characteristics of most of our customers' workloads. So that's why we pick um, the 24-hour tuning period specifically. You can imagine that, um, actually, and, and we do have this sometimes, and we're able to guard against it a bit, you know, and ignore weekend data. But a lot of times, like, over the weekend, the data that we collect will not be as, will not be representative of the actual workload because, um, I don't know, maybe the business isn't open. Depends on what it is, right? Uh, so those data points kind of are misleading for the algorithm. Um, that's a hard problem. And we, like I said, we can we can ignore weekend data, but that's about the best we can do. Um, it's just a matter of collecting more and more data at that point. Um, and I'll go in, actually, what I'm gonna go into this section, we'll touch on that a little bit more. Uh, it becomes less of a problem the smaller the search space is. Any other questions, Sandy? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering how um, Autotune is able to balance tuning parameters, like where optimization objectives, maybe there's some optimization related to latency or the query, how fast query runs. There might be different optimization objectives, as I understand, that might conflict. And the tuning parameters, I'm assuming, is like a limited set. Um, maybe you have 10 or 20 parameters that you might choose to optimize for auto tune. So with such a small set and with objectives that can vary, how do you balance which values to choose for any given parameter? Um, 
Great question. Uh, so I, the way that we do this, um, which I'm actually going to go over in this section, is we constrain knob ranges. And this is most important for knobs, which many of them are, like resource-related knobs, right? So knobs that control memory buffers, um, you know, knobs related to the number of processes. So we we basically, like, we know the customer's hardware. And we, uh, you know, purposefully choose conservative knob ranges that are the values that, that these knobs are, are allowed to, to take during the tuning session. They can take any, gen, usually any like value in between those ranges, but not outside of them. Does that answer your question? So I understand that the ranges exist, um, but do you somehow prioritize the performance objectives somehow? Or do you allow the user to specify which is more important to them? Oh, yes, yeah, so that, um, that, that is correct. So when the user first starts using Autotune, um, we have a tuning options panel where they, they go in and they can choose from a number of, you know, predefined target objectives that, that we've added over the past few years. So that would include like the query latency, throughput, CPU utilization, um, the, uh, for Aurora customers, um, you know, minimizing uh, read write IOPS is important. We haven't actually gotten any uh, requests for additional to, uh, target objectives, but yes, we do let the user define that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So let's um let's go ahead and jump in and oh and I'm running out of time. Okay, I'll try and speed through a little bit. All right. So, uh, so sorry, kind of rushing through this. Taking a step back, the way that we solve a lot of these problems. Um, which is kind of a no-no in research, is we incorporate a lot of domain knowledge. The reason I say it's a no-no in research is because, you know, that's kind of, I, I went over some of like the, I, I went over our goals with like the first audit tune paper, and we wanted to automate everything so that somebody who has no knowledge of a database can go in and use the algorithm and, you know, it spits out, like they can use it without any domain knowledge. But realistically, like in, um, in the commercial product, incorporating domain knowledge has been um, very, very helpful on two fronts. Um, first, it it's you know sort of the way that that we implement a lot of the safeguards. Um, I'd already mentioned the knob constraints, which I think I'll go over the next slide. Um, but then uh, it also allows us to um, to reduce the this um, the search base of configurations, which is incredibly helpful um, as because right now in research, I, I frequently look at papers and the um, convergence time, you know, can be dozens, hundreds. So, you know, we don't need to reach convergence at Autotune, but we do need to start seeing a benefit. And I domain knowledge is the way that we do this by restrict using basically what we know about MySQL, what we know about Postgres, what we know about databases, what we know about workloads to you know try and really restrain the um, search base to values that that might be good um so yeah like in general um i think research research is spot on like for most databases and workloads um there's probably 20 knobs that are really going to matter for that database um uh, it certainly is going to vary by workload but you know, trying like being able to narrow down the search base from you know hundreds of knobs to just you know ten to twenty is is very big. Um, so you know, like we we actually did this in the academic project, but some of the ways that we do this are we remove you know knobs that that really aren't tunable. They don't make sense to tune, like it's the port, or they require human judgment, and you know could you know cause consistency issues in the database. Um, and, oh, actually, this is an interesting tidbit. In the initial version of Autotune, we offered a database restarts. So customers could, could actually tune, you know, uh, parameters like shared buffer where it required restarting the database. But in the history of like two years, nobody had ever enabled it. So we, we didn't, you know, the functionality is still available in our backend, but, um, but we just don't expose that to users anymore. Uh, until we can think of like a little bit more clever way to um, provide that. Um, we also do, you know, 
use like automated feature selection techniques. Um, we have a data analyst who who does look at the data and and we, you know, we do some some automated analysis to to determine, you know, the most important knobs, for example. But at the end of the day, like a lot of it is still manual. Um, Bohan and I and and sometimes Andy are, you know, looking looking at all the knobs before they go into production. Um, and right now, Autotune recommends between 10 and 20 knobs per database systems. You know, for customers that are just getting started with tuning, um, RDS, Postgres, MySQL have the most. Uh, you know, Aurora removes some of the storage parameters. So that's why, you know, they decrease a little. And then serverless, I think, removes a, a couple more. So um, there are fewer knobs to tune with um, Aurora and Aurora serverless. Um, Wait, I have a qu question from the audience. Matt, Matthew, you want to ask your question? Sure. Uh, I was wondering, you're talking about configuration. I was wondering if you've done any machine learning on the output of explain for maybe high frequency queries or any queries? I have not. No. Andy, have you or has both? Yeah, so we don't get, right now in the auditing, the commercial version, we don't get the output to explain. Um, from customers because you have to enable that. Uh, there's a, it's a for Postgres, there's an extension you have to enable. Uh, for for the CMU database group, the research, which is completely separate from the Autotune, uh, yes, we, we do ML on the, the output to explain and analyze. So you can't, uh, you can't generate your own queries. Is that what you, in the product? Do you... it, 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 we can't generate query plans in the product. Uh, I do have a line. I do have a student working in research to inject plan hits into Postgres using PG plan hits based on tuning optimizations, which is completely separate than than the commercial product. Cool. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So, um, just going over the, the you know constrained knob ranges. Uh, this is just a, a couple of screenshots of our our UI for the tuning options, where you can you know select which knobs you want to tune, and and we provide. For for the you know between ten and twenty knobs that that are the recommended knobs, we come up with the bounds um, for you know for users. And honestly, it's a lot of work to come up with safe bounds, so it's it's pretty valuable. Um, users, if they click the um, show other knobs button at the bottom, uh, they can go in and you know tune whatever knobs they want, but they have to pick out their own knob constraints. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, we we do a lot of testing before adding you know new knobs, and we really think about the um, you know the the range of allowed values, and this is especially important for you know knobs like workmen, which are you know known to be a little little risky to tune. Um, we obviously have to use domain knowledge. Like the we know that um, those don't get a you know that's not just a single memory buffer in the database that gets you know applied. Um, Per connection, or I think it's more complicated than that. But these are important uh, things for us to take into account when when choosing this. Um, yep, and customers are allowed to go in and change this. Uh, but we are, you know, we we know with high probability that those values that we provide customers are are safe. Um, yeah. So what you know, how else do we incorporate domain knowledge? Um, so. You know, in order, another way that we can help speed up um, the, you know, the the convergence, uh, speed up the tuning process, is um, to help the machine learning algorithm discover, uh, you know, good regions in the search space. So one example of doing this with domain knowledge would be, you know, uh, we can take the um, the recommendation from PG Tune. And, you know, use that when we're like bootstrapping, you know, when we're first starting the tuning process to try and kind of land around like a, a good search region. Um, yeah, and then and then even after that, you know, so it's it's helpful to try um, settings that are you know, generally known to be good for most databases, they're, you know, kind of best practice um, guideline settings. It's, it's helpful to try those in the beginning of the tuning session. And then you can also try them later on. Um, we, you know, periodically kind of randomly will we'll include some, some heuristic based um, uh, recommendations um, when, when we like send off the, the full recommendation to the, uh, to the user. All right. Um, 
So manual controls and feedback. So we're kind of kind of done with the the domain knowledge bit for now. Um, these are mostly just uh, these are part of the tuning options panel. These are some of the safeguards and you know configurable things in in the tuning options that that we provide customers. Um, so the first uh, would be the tuning mode up here. So the tuning we have we have three tuning modes. Um, at the very bottom, you'll see self-directed tuning. This means like we we can't touch their you know their um, parameter group, which is how we apply the configurations. Um, they they basically uh, we provide the command line uh, prompt to that they can copy and then paste in their own terminal, you know, and use the the AWS CLI to to apply the the knobs. Um, so that's self-directed. We don't apply anything on behalf of the user. Um, the other two are where we um, do automate, you know, the tuning loop. The first one is auto tuning. So that's like full fledged. Um, we don't ask for the user's permission, you know, when applying knobs. Of course, the knobs, you know, are constrained to the values and that we um, showed in the previous slide. Uh, but but it's just kind of, you know, there's there's no human in the loop there. Whereas the second option, which is in the slide or in the screenshot, the currently selected one. It's called manual review. And it's it's basically like you as the user or somebody on your team needs to review and approve this configuration to be applied. And then we'll go ahead and apply it to the database. Um, I think, oh, nice. Okay, so I, I was curious, like how, you know, who's who's choosing what? So it looks like tw only 12% of, of our active users that are, you know, actively tuning their databases are, um, are choosing the self-directed tuning mode, um, which is pretty good if you look at it from a trust perspective. So unsurprisingly, manual review is is quite a you know bit more popular. Uh, but about thirty percent of our customers just kind of let us go at it. So that's uh that's pretty impressive. Um, and let's see what's the second. One. Oh yes, and then you know what what we hear from some customers is what we heard for a while was like they we just provide a bunch of knob configurations and they don't really know what they mean. They don't really know why this value is better than that value. So what we've been trying to do is like incorporate more um, explanations uh, in, in graphs in some cases to kind of explain like why, why we're choosing this setting or, you know, why we're making this recommendation. Um, ooh, performance improvement. So, uh, you know, like th the big question is always like, okay, so given all the noisy data and you know all all of the all of the um, challenges that we discussed in, in the second part of the talk, like, are are we even seeing any? Are we providing benefit to our users? Um, and the answer is yes, and and actually quite a bit of benefit. Um, so I guess for RES, we're seeing on average. Uh, I think it's about like 35, 40% improvement, whereas Aurora, we're seeing maybe closer to 50% improvement. Um, and this is, actually this covers a number of target objectives. So it's just whatever target objective they chose. Um, Andy had asked, Andy had like mentioned, hey, you, you should try and figure out like why Aurora is more, um, why, why are customers getting you know more benefit with Aurora than RDS? Um, and of course, I didn't actually have time to like really look into it, but uh, I I was thinking about it, and I'm curious if like the difference in I think that RDS is closer to 20 knobs, Aurora is closer to maybe 12. I would have to double check, but I I'm wondering if the um we're just tuning tuning fewer knobs, so people are seeing uh, more benefit more quickly. I really don't know. So that's a that's an open question that that we're going to try and solve, but very interesting. Um, you know, in some cases, some people are seeing you know a lot of benefit. Um, these are typically people that you know I'm guessing have haven't really done any tuning on their database. Uh, so the number of people that have done zero tuning, you know, is is around forty percent. Um, quite a few people have done some tuning, which is which is a bit surprising. Um, and so presumably like the low values here might be people who not only did some tuning, but, but tuned it well, um, you know, hard to say concretely. 
Does, does that graph like combine these stats of like whether I'm trying to optimize for CPU or, you know, IOPS and it just kind of combines them all together? That's correct, yes. So is this graph corresponding to the initial optimization page phase when um, auto-tune converges initially? I I think the answer is e I think the answer is yes. So so basically, um, we consider the baseline configuration, you know, the configuration we're trying to beat, um, the first configuration that we ever received from the user. So this is um, basically comparing the, I, I think Bohan, so Bohan's the one that prepared this data. And he probably like looked at the, you know, the, the data points, the time series parts that were relevant to the tuning. So times where we were applying configurations, I don't know if, you know, if somebody had their agent connected for three years, I don't think he was looking at that data, but yes, it's just basically like the, um, the best configuration that we recommended, uh, the percent improvement over the baseline configuration. I guess what I'm trying to get at is, uh, once the model does converge initially and you have a good, um, tuning set of parameters for the workload. I guess this depends on how the workload changes over time, but what's the marginal benefit over time uh, as you continue to re-optimize? Um, what, 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 what has your experience been uh, with auto-tune customers? Um, that's funny. I actually took Andy's slide that kind of answers this. Uh, it's a, it's just at the end of the slide deck. I can go over it quickly if we have time, but um, that's, that's actually one of the open problems that we're trying to solve now. Um, most of our users, because Autotune, once you get it set up, is pretty seamless, they just kind of let it run, you know, for a long time. And, and it's really easy to turn on again once you've turned it off. So that's not exactly answering your question. Like it I showed earlier that um let me go back to it. That workload that that was very I don't even see it in my slide deck. Anyway, sorry. The, it really depends on like how much the workload is changing, how much it, how much it's shifting, and that really varies between our customers. I you know unlike where where I can kind of see the workload patterns and I and I can tell that like a majority of our customers have this. As far as you know, analyzing um, like how you know workload shifts and and when they when they need to start tuning we don't have any like any solid analysis on that at the moment but I, i'll you. just chime in i'll just chime in and say that like it's very rare that we come across databases that are static meaning they are not adding new features which which you know schema changes query changes or the volume of the data increases uh it's very rare that databases are, at least the ones that come to us at Autotune are static where you don't need constant configuration. Now you can get, at least for knob tuning, most of the benefit in the beginning because uh, the, the default on Amazon is so terrible uh, for both RDS and Aurora. But for the, this is why we sort of expanded beyond just knob tuning, looking at query tuning, um, index index tuning, at least identifying you know, incorrect, incorrect indexes. Uh, because that that handles all the things as, as handles all the use cases where the application is evolving, and then people want to know whether their database is sort of still following best practices. This is the graph of Andy. Oh, sorry. This is Andy's graph that sort of covers it a little bit. I mean, it covers two different tunings. So initially, the customer, um, you know, applied uh, applied configurations. They went through a tuning session. Um, we improved their query latency by 88%. And then they applied it, um, you know, I, what is it, like a few months later, and we further improved uh, the target objective. However, in this case, I, I could see, you know, you can make the argument like, well, the workload didn't really change. They just didn't tune it long enough the first time. So it kind of does. Um, but our work, yeah, the customer workloads um, are, are pretty noisy, are pretty dynamic, and are frequently changing. I mean, we can see that in the queries that, you know, the, the slow queries that we collect too. Um, okay. So I think, okay, so, um, you know, like it's part of trying to trying to demonstrate, you know, our value to customers. Um, 
We've also come up with with a health score that encapsulates more than you know just the target objective that they're tuning um, in the knob configurations. So this will incorporate like their their health with with respect to like how we're scoring them for indexes, um, queries, uh, database resources. Um, so if they you know have have super high memory usage or something, uh, you know look at docs and points. Um, so in in this way, like this is. You know, it's kind of like um, a credit score. It's just a little bit of peace of mind. I don't know if a credit score is that much peace of mind, but it it kind of works in that same way. Um, all right. So with that, um, we shall conclude. Oh yes. So so a few open problems. Um, I I would love to see more sample efficient uh, tuning techniques out there. Uh, there's there's a tuning paper that was published back in 2022 called Llama Tune that I just love, and it's you know pretty like what they um, their research and their techniques are are pretty relevant to you know stuff that that we could actually apply um, uh, you know at, for to the Otter Tune uh, commercial version um, workload synthesis you know trying to uh, figure out how like every all of this kind of goes back to like generate you know dealing with training data, dealing with sample efficiency. So trying to come up with um, benchmarks or workload syn synthesis that can, you know, simulate workloads that, that are much, you know, more realistic than what we're seeing with TPCC, TPCH, um, et cetera. Um, and another really interesting one is, is kind of the, the starting stopping criteria, which is, is sort of related to, to the previous question about like when, when do you like stop tuning and you know when has the workload changed enough to where um to where you you want to pick back up tuning because there there could be a benefit from enabling it again um these are just a couple of questions uh of the many so that brings us to the conclusion um you know auto tune uh Oh, and it looks like, oh, interesting. I, I don't know if it, it looks like you didn't quite finish the conclusion, but that's okay because um, it's the conclusion. So in conclusion, um, basically we, you know, Otter Team started out as a research project. Um, it it was a great, it was a really fun research project to uh, work on actually. Um, we came up with a bunch of interesting techniques, but ourselves, you know, and some of the other re research that we see, um, it's a lot of like the assumptions and sort of the, the goals, like, you know, people, um, I, I see a lot of tuning papers come out, you know, focusing on different algorithms, yeah, you know, like maybe not the most important thing, uh, you know, on, on the industry side to solve for us. But um, so it's, you know, this talk has been kind of like some of the um, modifications that we've made and uh, to, to make AutoTune a commercial product. Um, and with that, any questions? Awesome. I will applaud on behalf of everyone here. Uh, so we have uh, a few minutes for questions for Dana. So if you have any questions, please please fire away. Yeah, I've got a couple. I'll start with one, Dana. You mentioned earlier in the talk that one of the crucial elements, if I got that right, was for you to be able to look at a workload and compare against a database of workloads and say, which workload is similar to mine so that I can better understand is that a good starting point for the parameters? Mm -hmm. Just categorizing a workload is complicated. And Andy explained, you don't get the explain output. So you're basically getting the queries and perhaps some stats from it. Are there some things you could disclose openly about how you compare two workloads and compute similarity between them? So I, I'm, I think, I'm sorry for the confusion in advance. Um, my little hat next to the auto tune did not work as well. That, that, um, algorithm is only being used in the research version of AutoTune. Right. So in the research version of AutoTune, we basically um, came up with, you know, a whole, our different workloads were just different variations of TPCC, YCSB, you know, and a whole bunch of other benchmarks that were in like uh, OLTP bench. So it, I, um, we haven't applied uh, that algorithm in, you know, to the commercial version of AutoTune because you know for the reasons you're mentioning, um, I think I think a a lot more work is needed. We need ultimately we just need more data and, and able to in order to be able to build any sort of generalizable model um, to to be able to you know 
find some of our previous data. And if you guys ever get interested in that, Andy probably knows this is a ton of really interesting work on transfer learning for instance, optimal uh, 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 optimization that will take some of those workloads, cast it into these gigantic vectors at times uh, that get used to encode things like lost language models. And they seem to work reasonably well, in, at least in some cases. So I've got a bunch of questions, but see if others want to go, others I'll pop back into the queue. Yeah, thanks. Uh Obviously, also the reason also it's hard to because the hardware varies so much, right? Mm -hmm. There's different instance sizes, uh, and then you have to deal with provision IOPS and other accoutrements you can add. So it's part of the database reason we'll be in the, yeah, the data in data versions is the other thing that, that screws things up. All right, uh, other questions. Aditya, go I have for a it. Question uh, about um, the kind of compute resources that you need to run AutoTune, um, and then the field. Okay, just like, what's our compute? How, how much compute do we use? Um, honestly, nothing special. Nothing special. Really? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're we're not uh, the so the okay the um the algorithm can be comp computationally uh, expensive if if you include um, a lot of samples. So if you have a lot of data points, um, that kind of you know controls like the complexity of the algorithm. And so we limit, oh, I forget the exact number, but we don't look any further back than like maybe a few months. We only use the data from like the previous few months versus you know the, the whole amount of data that we've collected. So that does um, help quite a bit. And then I had a follow up about um, as as I guess database systems change and you get maybe more tuning parameters. I'm assuming most tuning parameters probably change, uh, stay the same over the years. But as you do get new uh, parameters, how do you, like what kind of a delivery model do you have to deliver other tune updates? Well, I, like I kind of alluded to it, it's, it's pretty manual. Um, for example, like, it was in like, um, what am I thinking? There, there was some parameter that um, if, maybe in one of the later releases of Aurora, like if, you know, and this is a common problem. It's like if parameter X is set to zero, then parameter Y has no impact. And, um, you know, they, they were wondering like, well, why are you telling me to tune parameter Y if, if like, if this is the case that, you know, X has no impact and it honestly, like that's, that's another open problem. It's, it's hard to, to try and keep up with like all of those dependencies. Um, luckily, you know, my SQL hasn't been releasing, you know, too many knobs lately. So, so they've been easier to keep up with. Um, Postgres does really release a lot of versions, but in general, there have been a few cases. Sorry, it's it's ultimately just pretty manual at this point. Yeah, I guess so. I guess the team needs to constantly be aware of the updates and the development updates with respect to each database that's supported. Th that's correct. Yeah. So, luckily, like. It, whoever's working on it, it this this sort of um exercise typically happens when you know postgres releases a new version because you know they release much more frequently than mysql so whenever we need to go in and start supporting a new version that's when we kind of do that that review of the knobs thanks for answering my questions thank you all right we have time for one more question jignesh you want to go for it yeah i think it's uh, uh two sides of the same coin do you have you thought of optimizing things other than the main database, like a replica, or even consider whether you could look at the workload and say, you know what, you're on Postgres, you'd better be, you are better off even in that same ecosystem as it is Aurora or RDS to move to MySQL or vice versa. So we try to apply it like outside that main box of just optimizing the master database. So we, the Yes and no. I I actually like I'll, I'll split this into two parts. So as far as um, you one of the 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 latter thing you mentioned is where we really want to be. Um, what we really want to be able to do is uh, be able to make instance type recommendations, and you can imagine that that would generalize to you know potentially like uh, choosing between like oh when is you know Aurora better suited for your workload versus RDS. Um, I think that that was like kind of one of your questions. We are looking into the very early stages of that right now. 
um, with our data analyst. But, um, you know, it honestly, like if, if you see that feature come out for us, like it's great. We'll get funding then like that. That's such a hard problem. <laughs> um, so I'd love to solve that. Uh, on the other side, I think you also mentioned like we tried tuning replicas. Um, I didn't really go into Aurora support, but it's it's actually kind of interesting. Um, we we could do a lot there, and the reason we don't is honestly for business and pricing reasons. It gets a little tricky. Um, but we have like so. Oh, AWS allows you to tune at the instance and at the cluster level, for example. Um, so you could imagine like some some like formula of tuning there but typically what we tell customers is well just tune your read replica then tune your write replica then you know tune your other read replicas um because in order to be able to do more sophisticated things like that we need to be collecting metrics you know like the um uh the database metric data and we're having a hard time getting that information for aurora um for all of the replicas to be able to do something interesting there so it just hasn't been prioritized. I don't know if that made sense, but um yeah, no, that made sense. Excellent answers and awesome talk. Thank you. Okay.